First question is, how can we be sure we are rejecting self-condemnation over confessed sin and not just taking sin lightly? Self-condemnation is something that comes to all sensitive believers in the early stages of their Christian life. Uh, Self-condemnation and spirit of discouragement. Those who are not sincere or hypocrites, they never feel it because they just carry on sinning and take the Christian life lightly. But anyone who takes the Christian life seriously can go through period of self-condemnation and it is totally wrong to have it because Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and it's important for us to understand the context in which it comes I've often said that you must ignore chapter divisions when you study the because in the original there were no there were no chapters in the original letters. So when you read just as a principle of Bible study, whenever you come to the beginning of a chapter, I would always encourage you anywhere, go back to the last three verses of the previous chapter and see if there's a connection. Because you'll see, a, many times you'll see something. In the same way, when you come to the end of a chapter, try and read the next two, three verses to see if there's a connection before you close your reading. So here, listen to this and see if it sounds right to you. The last part of verse 25. On the one hand, 725, I myself with my mind serve the law of God. But with my flesh, I'm serving the law of sin, but there is no condemnation. How do you work that out? My flesh is serving the law of sin, but there is no condemnation because I'm in Christ. I don't know how many of you have linked those two verses together and tried to understand it. So it, uh, it's, it's, it requires a whole Bible study starting from 7.14 to 25. <clears throat> if you're seriously interested in it, I'd say go to the CFC website and go to the New Testament verse by verse and look up that section. <clears throat> I understand it like this. My mind means what I'm choosing of my own free will. I'm serving the law of God. I want to do all of God's will. But unconsciously, I'm doing a lot of things which are not Christ-like because I've not yet become like Christ. I've been, none of us will become totally like Christ until he comes again. And it's in this unconscious area where we are unchrist-like. And that is some, when we get light on it, it becomes a conscious area. And then we can get into condemnation when he slip up. And the other thing is when we are seeking for a life of victory, we are frequently defeated in the early stages. We don't come into a life of victory as soon as we ask for victory. It takes time. And uh, you alone know whether you're taking sin lightly or not. If you take sin seriously, you need never condemn yourself. That I can say. Because it's we don't come to victory like that. It takes a while to come to a place where sin does not have dominion over us. He's, think of a person who's just converted and his sins are all forgiven. He's absolutely sure. And he comes here and hears about the life of overcoming. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law but under grace. But the fullness of that grace has not come in and so he's still defeated and that's the time when he can be condemned now only he himself can know 
whether he's taking sin lightly or not. Sin must never be taken lightly. And if you're in a, if it's a doubtful area, consider it a sin. Whatever is doubtful is sin. Until you're, if you're crystal clear, that is not sin. And the way to check is, is my will set to accept it or reject it? If I see something and I say, my will is set to reject it, but I slipped up here. Then I confess it immediately. And uh, we must believe what it says in 1 John and chapter 1. It's the verse we must always remember. 1 John and chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And also verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. To walk in the light basically means to be absolutely, ruthlessly honest. In other words, don't pretend that it was not lust when it was. If you're in doubt, call it lust. You're absolutely sure you're not. It's not. And uh, we have to be careful since sometimes you try and find an excuse for looking at a pretty girl and saying, well, I was only admiring the beauty of God's creation. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to say <laughs> so that you will never overcome it. So call sin, sin. It's better to call it by the worst possible name and then you steer away from it. Okay. Next question is, we see more and more men falling away in the sexual area. And that's happened recently. There have been many reports in Christian circles of People who are top pastors, who have been pastors for years, who are in their 60s and 70s, falling into sin. It's absolutely amazing. People who nobody expected it. And they've been removed from the, from the ministry after having been in the ministry for 30, 40 years. What practical advice would you give us men, married and single, to ensure that we all maintain the highest standard of purity in the sexual area? See, Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 5 that lusting with our eyes is so serious that you can go to hell. There are only two places in Matthew 5 in the whole Sermon on the Mount where Jesus spoke about hell. Only two places. And one was related to anger in verse 22. And the other was related to uh, lusting with the eyes or sinning sexually with your hand, verse 30. Both are mentioned here, 29 and 30. You can sin sexually with your eyes or with your hands. And both, of, he says, you can go to hell. So when I see that that's what the, that's what the Lord thinks about uh, sexual sin without committing adultery physically, then we take it very seriously. If that is something that can send me to hell, I don't think most, even most Christians believe that's a serious thing. Because he said, I'm not, harming, I'm not harming anybody. I'm just looking anger, at least you hurt somebody by your anger. That's understood. But you can say, with that lust with my eyes or sin with my hand, who am I hurting? Nobody. Why should that send me to hell? That's an interesting question. So it, it is because it pollutes my mind and pollutes my heart. And if I'm asking now, as far as an unbeliever is concerned, he can do what he likes. But if Christ is dwelling in our heart, I must not allow anything to pollute my heart. So if I take that as my standard and seek to fight sexual sin in the level of uh, the level of my eyes, I'll never fall into the type of sexual sin a lot of these other people are falling into, adultery. It requires a ruthless attitude towards the eye. It requires a turning away our eyes from anything that's tempting us. And if it is something on our phone or the internet, pornography of any sort, we have to turn away from it, 
immediately. Because these images that come into our mind, even if you've seen it only for a few seconds, remains in our mind much more than a lot of other things that we put into our mind. Mm -hmm. And perhaps all men know that there are things in their mind which they never seem to get rid of because sometime in the past they put some of these dirty sexual images into their mind, watch seeing it somewhere and uh, it just stays there forever. And the Lord has left it, kept it like that so that we hate it and keep ourselves pure. So the mind is very important for, as far as God is concerned in this area. Uh, to lust after a woman whom God has not given us to be our wife is to desire something which God has not given. That's a form of covetousness. That's why the Bible says it's better to burn, it's better to marry than to burn. That God gives us a wife and get married and be satisfied with your wife. And until you get married, of course, fight the battle. That fighting the battle until we get married is a very good habit because I asked, I asked the Lord once, Lord, why, did, why do you allow this desire for attraction to the opposite sex to come up in a young boy when he's 13 or 14 years old? Just this attraction to a girl. She can very lead on later on to sexual temptation and now in many places it starts even earlier. So I said, Lord, why didn't you allow this attraction to come up when you're 24 or 25? You know, till then we behave just like innocent little boys and girls towards each other. And the Lord said, it's because I want all young men to overcome that before they get married. That's why God allows us to be tempted in the sexual area almost from the age of 13 or 14 years. And so that by the time you get married at 24, 25, 30 or something, you have overcome it. Now, very few people are faithful in that area, but that is the reason why God allows us to be tempted in a, at a very young age with it. So we must take that very seriously. And if we take lusting with the eyes very seriously, then I believe God will never allow us to fall physically into sin. And not just physically, it can even, you know, uh, I like this verse in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. And verse, verse 1, the second part is good for a man not to touch a woman. So, this hugging women and all is not a good habit at all. I never do it. It's, we have to be very careful. It's very easy to be tempted. Anyone that's not your wife, Better to keep a respectable distance and better not to touch at all. It's better not to, I mean, I suppose shaking hands is okay, but any other type of touch is something we have to avoid as far as possible. And if you are utterly faithful in this area and if you slip up even slightly in your thought life, maybe you, maybe you saw a poster or some page in a magazine and quickly a thought came into your mind, confess it immediately and be ruthless and say, Lord, I committed adultery. If we call it by the worst possible name, then there's some chance of our overcoming it. But if you say, well, that was a slight slip up, you'll be defeated perpetually. Always call sin by the worst possible name you can call it. So this is a very serious area because if we don't overcome in this area before you get married, you'll be defeated. Don't think marriage will solve your problem. 
you'll be defeated even after you're married for years. So it's wonderful if you can really take it seriously and say, Lord, before I get married, I want to get complete victory over this and have an attitude of immediately turning away from anything that brings lust into my mind. And if you find that certain even news programs tend to there are there are different news programs some are a little cleaner than the others in the sense that it's not that they are advertising uh, dirty pictures but some news programs have advertisements with more provocative pictures of women dressed immodestly than other news programs so be careful about what you watch and then you can protect yourself and you'll have a very happy marriage with your wife. Okay, next question is, how does one bridle our tongue while at work and facing accusations? The Bible says that we run the race looking unto Jesus. So, Jesus is the great example who, when he was accused falsely of some terrible, terrible things, it says in Matthew 27 and verse 12, while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. And Matthew 27 verse 14, and Pilate asked him, he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. Even though they were accusing him falsely, all the accusations were false, but he didn't defend himself. He just left it. And that is our example. So for that, we need to ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit. See, I believe that when on the day of Pentecost, when they were filled with the Spirit and they suddenly began to spoke, speak in unknown languages, which they never knew, it was the Holy Spirit controlling their tongue and speaking forth words which they didn't no, was another language. But I believe that one of the things the Lord was trying to teach them through that was that the tongue would be the main instrument, main part of the body that God is going to use in this new covenant age for spreading his word and for building the church. The tongue is the main. And secondly, that the tongue is the one part of our body that we really need to bring under the control of the Holy Spirit. So that is the meaning I see of the gift of tongues, which many people haven't understood. So we must prepare our heart beforehand. And as I said, how shall we bridle our tongue? By looking at the example of Jesus. Everything, looking unto Jesus is the way we run this race and asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can say the two secrets of the Christian life are to be filled with the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to show us the life of Jesus. The combination of these two will make us fight and resist sin and overcome. I want to say one more thing in relation to condemnation, and that is we must believe with all our heart what it says in Hebrews 8 and verse 12, verse that when the Lord says, I will not remember their sins anymore. So that means we don't have to keep remembering the past, our failures. I failed then, I failed then. The Lord says, you have asked forgiveness, it's cleansed in the blood. I will not remember it anymore. That's it. And take the Lord's word for it. Okay, the next question is, how do you hear God speaking to you? Do you hear him speak to you every day? Are there times when you have not heard from the Lord? What practical advice do you have for those who want to hear God speaking to them every day? As it says in Matthew 4, 4, which is, and shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which is a very important verse. In other words, to live, according to Matthew 4, 4, you need to hear what God is speaking. In other words, without hearing what God is speaking, according to Matthew 4, 4, you will not be able to live the Christian life as God wants you to. 
And the other verse quoted here is Isaiah 50 and verse 4, which is also a very, very important verse. Isaiah 50 verse 4, the middle of that verse says, God wakes me up morning by morning. He wakes my ear to listen as a disciple. This is a verse that I have tried to live by for many years. Uh, in the early days, not consistently, but now consistently since quite some time. That when I wake up in the morning, it's good to believe that it's the Lord who woke me up. Well, there may be in other circumstances, but the Lord woke me up. And the purpose of waking me up is so that he wakens my ear, my inner ear, to listen. As a disciple, to listen, saying, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What do you want to tell me today? And so, if when I wake up in the morning, you say, Lord, I believe you want to wake up my inner ear to hear what you have to say to me. So, I want to hear. It's the best way to begin the day. I've been saying repeatedly over the last few weeks, when you, before you get out of bed, either while you're lying there with your head uh, awake or you sit up in bed and say, Father, I want to hear you. Or similar words. I want to hear what you're trying to say to me today. It'll always be a word of comfort, encouragement, victory, triumph something to praise God for and to show me, like it says in this verse, to listen as a disciple. That means maybe something I have to obey in some area right from that time onwards. So that's a very good thing to develop a daily discipline to hear as soon as you wake up in the bed before getting out of bed. Once you get out of bed, you, you get distracted with so many things. And then later on, you can read your Bible portion whenever you get time. But spend a few minutes. If you can spend 15 minutes before you get up, excellent. But even if you can spend only five minutes as soon as you get up, very good to make you aware that you have to listen to God. And it doesn't mean that I've listened for five minutes, then I close my inner ear. No. I've opened my inner ear in the morning to listen throughout the day. God may speak to me anytime. And uh, the other verse quoted here is Psalm 1, verse 2 and 3, which says that he delights in the law of the Lord and his law he meditates day and night. He doesn't read the Bible day and night, but he meditates on it day and night. He will be like a fruitful tree. So that prompt, there's a promise that if you keep listening to the Lord whenever throughout the day in different situations, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? Your life will be fruitful. Okay, then what are some of the day, practical daily disciplines that you have that helps you to be effective in accomplishing the work God has called you to do? I think we must discipline our time in how we spend our time. And that is, we need to ask ourselves, are our, not saying that we become so crazy that every single minute must be uh, accounted for and we can't relax or, or daydream. There's nothing wrong in that. But there must be, uh, say, Lord, I want to make full use of today. I don't want to waste, waste any day. And... Help me to be disciplined throughout okay. in during the day in the middle of your work. If you find a break, good to get into the habit of saying, Lord, is there anything you want to tell me? In between, when you're when you're free from your work, say, Lord, is there anything you want I hear to hear? You want me to hear? That's a good habit to have. And the other area of discipline is eating and sleeping. I believe we all need to get the necessary hours of sleep on an average, eight hours if possible. Sometimes you can't, you've got a lot of work to do. But we need to get enough rest to be fit. And the other thing is, particularly, more than sleeping, I think, is 
our eating. Uh, if we are not disciplined, daily disciplined, if you are not disciplined in our eating, you know, the Bible speaks of the possibility of New Testament Christians making their stomach their God. That's one of the warnings given us in Philippians and chapter 3 speaks about disciplining our appetite. Philippians chapter 3 and verse, we must begin at verse 18. The last part, it speaks about those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now you think that this people of some heathen religion who are enemies of the cross of Christ. But who are these enemies who are the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction? They are those who worship their stomach and their appetite. Their appetite is their God. And God is someone who tells you to do something, you do it. So your appetite tells you do this or eat this and eat this and indiscriminately we follow our appetite without, any, without controlling it. Then it has become our God. And then says you're an enemy of the cross of Christ. And Paul is so concerned about that. He says in verse 18, he's weeping. I tell you, even weeping. He's so concerned that there are Christians who are ruining their effectiveness for God because they don't control their appetite and their glory is in their shame. And their mind is constantly set on earthly things. So when you think of discipline, here is a major area where we should all discipline ourselves in the matter of eating. Uh, that means we must be controlled in our eating. Like I read someone say, the best push-ups that you can do are the push-ups from the table <laughs> when you're eating. <laughs> uh, because if you learn to discipline your appetite there, it can help you very much in the Christian life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 to 27 is a whole section on discipline, daily discipline. He says, you know, like in the Olympic races, everybody runs, only one receives the prize. And he's telling all these Corinthians, this is the interesting thing, all of you can come first. This is the wonderful thing about the Christian life. Everybody can come first. He's not saying only one person went. All of you Corinthians who are such a carnal bunch of Corinthians, Christians they were, run in such a way that you will win. So all of us can win the prize. But if you want to win, it says like these people who win in the earthly races, they exercise self-control, verse 25, and all things. They do it to receive some gold medal or something. But So he says, I also run in we an imperishable reward. So he says, I discipline my body, verse 27, and make it my slave. Or in other words, I tell my body what it should do. My body doesn't tell me well, what it should do. In other words, it's not my appetite that's going to tell me. We all have appetites, sleep, sex, food. These are the three main, sleep, sex, and food. These are normal, normal to sleep. It's normal. There's a normal sex in marriage. And it's normal to have, want food and water. But these normal appetites can, we can become enslaved to them, that they become our gods, like it says there, whose God is their appetite. That means they have no self-control. And a lot of sicknesses like blood pressure and diabetes and high cholesterol levels all come very often through indisciplined eating. And God wants all of us to live long lives. He doesn't want any of our lives to be shortened. And I feel if any of us come to the end of our life and we discover that our life was shortened because of an indisciplined eating habit 
or indiscipline in the area of sex, etc. We'll have a lot of regret when we stand before the Lord. I, I often feel that way. I've said to the Lord, Lord, I want to live every single day that you planned for me before I was born. It says in Psalm 139 that the number of my days, verse 16, was planned before I was born. So if God planned the number of my days before I was born, I say, Lord, I want to fulfill all of it. And that's not going to happen automatically. I have to cooperate with God by disciplining myself and not, especially in the matter of eating and sleeping and in the sexual area. These are the three areas where we need discipline. And if we do that, we'll have the joy when we come to the end of our life saying, like Jesus said, I have finished the work you gave me to do. You know, all of us want to glorify God. The Bible says, whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. That's whether you eat or drink. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Eating and drinking, you must do for the glory of God. Now, how can I say at the end of my life that I've glorified God? There's only one way. The way Jesus said, the end of his life, John 17 and verse 4. John 17, 4, Jesus said, I have, Father, I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. That's why Jesus couldn't take a holiday to Rome. Because that was not his father, father's plan. A wholehearted disciple of Jesus will really seek to fulfill God's plan in his life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying taking a holiday is wrong. I think it's perfectly okay. But what I'm saying, in Jesus' case, he wouldn't do it. Uh, we have to see, Lord, I've got only one life, and I want every day of that to count for you in some way. By what? Not by running around and preaching and always reading the Bible, no. Fulfilling God's plan for our life by saying, Lord, I don't want to waste one day. I want to live every day in a, with a clean mind and a clean heart and listening to you. And I don't necessarily hear every day what God wants me to do. But if I live with a clear conscience, that's all. If I live with a clear conscience and discipline myself, you can be absolutely sure when you come to the end of your life, you would have finished the work God gave you to do without any God having to say to you every day what to do. Okay, how are both these, next question, true in the life of a dis, life of discipline? True, two statements, go and sin no more. Well, you know, you must always see a quotation in its context. Where, do you know where that comes? Anybody? Hmm? Yeah, the woman caught in adultery. John chapter 8, where this woman, uh, Jesus forgave her and said, John 8, 11, from now on, sin no more. He was not saying that you're going to have total victory over sin from now on. No. He was saying, don't commit adultery again. I, I always understand a word in its context. So that's how we understand that word in that situation. Of course, we should avoid sin, but we will not be completely free from unconscious sin until the Lord comes again. But we must seek to be free from conscious sin in the beginning. All conscious sin, everything that you know to be sinful, you must say, Lord, give me the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome that. And then, Lord, give me light on the areas of unconscious sin over which I need to, which I need to overcome. I pictured my, it's something like this, if I were to draw a diagram. My flesh is like a big black circle. And in the beginning, I've got light on just a little bit on the rim. So that becomes white. But then where the white touches the black, I'm battling, 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 battling. Uh, draw zigzag lines along there. And I overcome a little bit of that black. So the white increases. This size, the thickness of that white circle becomes more. I've overcome some of this black area. And then I keep fighting, 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 fighting. 
the black is the unconscious area, unconscious in my life. And a little more. That's how progressively we overcome sin more and more and more and more. That which becomes unconscious, that which is unconscious, becomes conscious. Or to use an illustration, if there's a cube of ice in this glass, 10% of that ice is above the surface and 90% is hidden. It's a picture of conscious area, unconscious area. So if I take a knife and slice off that top 10% of the piece of ice, that's overcoming victory over conscious sin, immediately a little bit of that bottom ice which is below the surface of the water comes up. I get a little more light on hidden areas of my life, then I battle with that. And I slice off that part, some more comes up. This is how we grow in grace and grow with overcoming sins, which once we did not even know was sin. But now I know it is sin. So that is how we progressively become more and more Christ-like. And so this statement, little by little, he's changing me, is another question. What, how do you understand these statements? Well, that's a chorus, little by little, he's changing me. It's true he's changing me, but he does not change me without my cooperation. See Philippians in chapter 2. The way God leads us to victory, it says here in Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 12 and 13. First of all, verse 13. Why do I say that first? Because the word verse begins with the word for. For means because. So whenever I read for or because, I must start with that verse. It is God who is at work in you. God is working inside you. That means that's always referring to the Holy Spirit. God working outside us. He's Almighty God working the Father. But inside me means it's always the Holy Spirit. What does He work in me? Two things. One is to desire His will and to do His will. To will and to work his goodwill. So God is at work in me. So because God is at work in me, verse 12, it says, you must work out your salvation from the sin you're getting light on with fear and trembling. That's the connection between these those two verses. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God is, at the, first of all, begin doing some work inside you. So it's a tremendous encouragement for us to know that the Holy Spirit always working inside us to do what? Verse 13. To desire His will and to do His will. I need the desire to do God's will. Some of us may think that we had it ourselves. No, it's conceited, pride to think I had a desire to do God's will. Not at all. No man in the world has got any interest to do God's will. If you have an interest to do God's will, it is the Holy Spirit produced it in you. But that's only half his job. The Holy Spirit wants to do the second part, which is to work his will, to will and to do. So the, the Holy Spirit to produce the will will also enable you to do it. You must just, but there you have to cooperate with him and work out your salvation from your sinful nature, from the sin in the flesh, with fear and trembling. Why fear and trembling? Because it's it's so subtle. Sin is such a subtle thing. We can sin without even realizing it sometimes. So there must be fear and trembling in me. Okay, another question is concerning our relationship with our wives. How do we, this is for married people, how do we encourage our wives or women in the church that their labors are not in vain, in vain and that they are just as valuable as the men when most scripture puts men in the place of authority and prominence? Well, History, the history of the Christian church is full of examples of some wonderful women missionaries who've done a tremendous work for God in areas where men could do almost nothing. See, to work among the women and widows in India, no men, man would, would do it because the widows and women will not allow a man to come near them in the villages in India. But there are women missionaries like Amy Carmichael who went and 
helped many of those people to care of their orphan children, etc. So women have had a tremendous ministry through the years, missionaries and others. And so I believe that every sister in the church has some ministry to accomplish to other sisters primarily. And that need not be, many often, many people think ministry is only in the church. Okay, on Sunday after the initial sharing, the mic is passed around and they can share. But that's not the only time they can share. When it says in 1 Corinthians and chapter 14, One Corinthians fourteen. Pursue love. It's addressed to everybody. Every brother, sister must pursue love, and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So, can a woman prophesy? Sure. Because you got to understand what prophecy is. It says here is defined. Prophecy is defined. It's not like the Old Testament prophecy, which is foretelling the future. New Testament prophecy is speaking to people, verse 3, for building them up, challenging them, comforting them, encouraging them. Exhortation means challenge plus encouragement. Edification is building them up. Consolation is comforting them. When a sister speaks to another sister on the telephone, she can do all of that. Prophecy. It's not only in the church at all. It can be in ordinary conversation when they visit one another. So it's it's a something that we should encourage our sisters to they are in touch with God. You never know how one word that you share, you tell your wife, and then one word that you share with another sister can encourage encourage her. So try to be in touch with the Lord. We must tell our wives. Read the scripture, something God may Put something on your heart that day. If you're consistently reading the scripture regularly in a disciplined way, I found often God gives me a word from scripture. God gives me guidance very often. So it's a habit that we should encourage all our wives and sisters to do sometime during the day. I remember when our children were very small and they would all be awake and crying in the morning and they need mommy to help them. Annie would never get time in the morning. She she would have a quiet time mostly at night after the children have gone to bed. So it doesn't matter when, but we must encourage our wives to take some time to listen to God's word. You know, if we can have it on audio, they can be listening to it while they're feeding the baby or something like that. So it's, it's easy. It, you know, there are we can listen to something while we're doing something else or they're cooking or anything. But it's very important if they can hear something and then they are blessed by it and you never know. They may come an opportunity during the day to share that with somebody who calls them up on a phone and to say, well, after finishing the conversation, say, well, sisters, I just thought I'd share this one word with you. Just one minute. And it's a prophecy. and You never know. It may be of help to that other sister at the other end of the line. So we should encourage all our, not to become preachers and not to say, okay, every single time I'm going to give, give an exhortation to the other person, they'll get fed up of <laughs> listening to you. But be sensitive and there's a prompting to share something or somebody comes to visit you to share something. See, most women are such experts at gossiping that they're communicating, but the only thing is they're communicating the wrong thing. So you should encourage them to share something which is of value. And so they are of as valuable as the men. And uh, even though men have got authority in the home, anyone can prophesy. Men or women, you know that it says in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, 5, even in the church, a woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. 
That means she can prophesy. What do you think she's got to cover her head? Prophecy is what? We already saw that in 14 and verse 3. So even in the church, a sister can share something that will be a blessing to others. It all depends on whether she's keeping herself in touch with God and keeping a clear conscience. That's all that's required. You don't need to know great knowledge of the scripture. They're not called to be teachers. But you keep a clear conscience. I believe God will speak to every sister who keeps a clear conscience and will give her some opportunity to share maybe something with another person, maybe once a month or once in two months or whatever. It doesn't have to be every day. Okay, how do we husbands, next question, practically love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, as it says in Ephesians 5 and 25. Well, Christ is our example. And when he washed the disciples' feet, he was doing the job of a slave. Slaves are the ones who washed feet in that culture. He was doing a dirty job for his disciples. He, that, that feet needed cleaning, he cleaned it. In other words, he was willing to do any lowly job. There was no sense of false sense of dignity that I'm the leader, how can I do that? Sometimes husbands can feel that way, some husbands anyway. Then how can I do that? Well, okay. why not? There's nothing too lowly for a husband to do. So we should not, our, we love and our love produces service and should make us sensitive to her temperament and her need. What does it say in 1 Peter chapter 3 about husbands? One Peter chapter three verse seven. What does it mean when it says live with your wives in an understanding way? That's the command to husbands. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. So let me read it continually. Live with your wives understanding that she is a weaker vessel. I'm just reading the same verse. And understanding that though she's a weaker vessel, she's still an equal heir sitting in your th throne is on the same level as yours in the grace of life. And if you do that, your prayers will be answered more quickly. So a husband has to understand that the woman is a weaker vessel and not she's weaker emotionally, she's weaker physically. Some things that don't disturb you at all will disturb her. So. Don't ask her stupid questions like, why does that disturb you <laughs> when it doesn't disturb me? Well, the answer to that is you're a man. That's all there is to it. Why does it disturb you when it doesn't disturb me? <laughs> you're a man and she's a woman. Simple answer. <laughs> she's a weaker vessel. I use the example of when you travel, if there are two suitcases, I hope you as men lift the heavier one. And she can't live there, everyone. She's weaker in every way. Remember that also. In, I'm not saying that you've got to do all her odd jobs for her. She's, God's called a woman mainly to be a worker at home. So there are a lot of jobs in the home that she does. But there's one thing we can do, and that is to encourage her. And whenever, whenever possible, if you encourage her, that can make a big difference. Encouragement gives a boost to a person in the work they are doing. So that's one practical way in which you can love your wife and show your love for your wife. Uh, how do we practically love our wives as our own bodies, like it says in Ephesians 5.28? Well, you know how we care for our own bodies. I, I often thought of when it says the husband is the head of the wife. There are two things his head does. One, it tells the parts of the body to do something, pick up that, or tell the legs to go here. But the other thing the head is does is very sensitive. If a mosquito comes and sits on my hand, the head immediately knows it and drives away that mosquito. 
So to me, that's a picture of, think of your hand, if your wife, your hand is your wife and you're the head. Something that's troubling your wife, a mosquito sitting on the hand. You must be sensitive to it and help her to be free from it. Just like you drive that mosquito away. The head drives away the mosquito from the body. So husbands love your wives like your own body. And you can apply that in many other areas. Meditate. Some of these verses, you know, you'll never, what I'm telling you, you'll find yourself if you just meditate on it. Uh, many people, unfortunately, just read. They don't meditate. If you meditate, you'll get a lot of light on how you must love your wife as your own body. Okay. What are some practical ways for husbands to safeguard against becoming bitter without being harsh towards our wives? That's from Colossians and chapter 3 and verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter against them. See, bitterness is usually something the result of an accumulated feeling of something that's disturbed you about your wife's behavior or something you feel she should have done for you, not to, did not do. And you keep that in mind. If you keep something in your mind, it'll make you bitter. Best is to get rid of it. Or discuss it with her and clear it off immediately. But if you keep something in your mind, she didn't do this, or she did this, or she said this, or she should have told me this earlier, and you keep that in your mind, it will lead to some type of bitterness. It makes you weak, you know? And then when you're, when you're weak, the next time some temptation comes, you won't be strong enough to overcome it. Some temptation, I mean some provocation in relation to your wife, you'll get upset, or you'll raise your voice, and then you'll feel sorry afterwards and ask forgiveness. That is second best. Best is no, you don't raise your voice at all. So, as soon as something comes up in your heart which you feel your wife should have done or did not do or did which she should not have done, if there's a scope for bitterness there. Get rid of it. If it's something to be clarified, clarify with her. Best is ignore it and forget it. Because most of these things that disturb us are trivial, unimportant things who are not even worth talking about. How do I know? I'm a, I'm, <laughs> I've been a husband for 56 years. <laughs> That's why I know a lot of trivial things. That, and uh, I've learned through experience, just forget it. Don't let it disturb you. And then life becomes very peaceful. You can have a heavenly atmosphere in your home. Yeah, but otherwise it's very easy. If you keep anything in your mind, I tell you, over a period of time, it will develop into bitterness. It's like an infection. You get a cut and it's infected and you don't wash it off or you don't put any medicine there. It will get infected. It's a natural tendency of the body is towards getting infected. You've got to do something to prevent it. So the natural tendency, once you feel something should have been done, or uh, was or uh, should not have been done. If you keep that in mind, it'll get infected. The best is to clear it off, get rid of it from your mind, because most of these things are so trivial and unimportant that it's ridiculous to even keep such a thing in our mind. Okay, this now the next section is on work, physical exercise, and hobbies. How do we balance seeking to advance in our jobs by studying or learning in order to remain relevant to the company we work for and also keeping up with the rising cost of living while still seeking the kingdom of God first? Seeking the kingdom of God first is not a matter of number of hours a day. It's got nothing to do with that. You can be busy the whole day in your secular work and still your basic desire in your life must be the kingdom of God first. So we shouldn't think seeking the kingdom of God first is doing certain things for the Lord, witnessing to somebody today, then I've sought the kingdom of God first. No. 
something that liberated me was when Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I say, let me compare scripture with scripture. What is the kingdom of God? Romans 14 and verse 17. This is what liberated me. Because earlier on, I thought seeking the kingdom of God first, first means every day I must witness to somebody or give out some tract. And that is seeking the kingdom of God first. But the, compare scripture with scripture. Romans 14, 17 says, here is a definition. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay. So what do we mean by seeking the kingdom of God first? I must seek righteousness in the Holy Spirit first in my life. I must seek to always be at peace, the peace of the Holy Spirit. Always, that must be first. And the joy of the Holy Spirit, always, that's first. So to seek the kingdom of God first is primarily seeking for righteousness, being absolutely upright in every area of my life, living in constant peace in my heart, inwardly and outwardly with all people, and having an inner joy, which is others may not be able to see. but you know that Old Testament verse, Nehemiah 8.10, which says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. strength. Nehemiah 8.10. It applies in the New Testament too. I have found, if you are rejoicing, it's a much easier to get victory over sin. And if you are the complaining, grumbling type, you'll be defeated by sin. So joy has got a tremendous ability to enable us to be overcomers in our daily life. So seek the kingdom of God first. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then as God gives you opportunity, we seek to be witnesses to others. So don't condemn yourself that seeking the kingdom of God first is doing something for the Lord today or witnessing to at least one person today. Now some people may have that type of calling, but you can read somebody's testimony and say, I wish I could do that. But all don't have that calling. So anything that condemns you Forget it and seek for this. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And as you get opportunity, seek to uh, witness to others whenever you get a chance. In other words, I must always be alert all the time for any opportunity I get to witness, yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't condemn myself if I don't get that opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> here is a, specifically my industry has been in a slump for over a year. I'm just getting by doing part-time work until things go back to normal. However, I have a lot of time on my hands and I've been meditating for, for a while on starting my own business. Would this be a wise pursuit? These are things which we, one cannot tell for another. But coming back to seeking the kingdom of God first and seeking to advance in our jobs, we must be realistic. We must realize that Fields like computer science is a constantly developing subject. And if you're just keeping in touch with what it was a year or two ago, you're out of touch. And you may, if you don't keep pace with the development in that sphere, you could even find yourself inefficient in your job and unable to do it. So you must keep in touch with the latest developments in your field. And that's just computer science I'm thinking of. It could apply to other areas too. We must, therefore, there's nothing wrong in doing a course or seeking some type of study in order to advance in our jobs. I believe we should seek to advance in our jobs, definitely. I don't believe we should remain in the same level in any job. If you enter a job, you should seek to get as many promotions as possible without spending all your time pursuing that and ignoring church and Christian activity. But there's a balance which only you can decide depending on your particular profession. And whether you should start your own business or not, <clears throat> I've discovered that some people just have a knack for business. I met some people like that. You know, they do something and they prosper like anything. If I ever went into business, I'd be, I'd be a total failure. I know that because I don't have that type of mindset. 
uh, but some people have it and they they take some risks and they accomplish a lot so one shouldn't go into a field if you're not too sure that you have some ability for it better to start with something that you can handle and that you have a inclination towards before you you know there's this the proverb in English which says, look before you leap. Before you jump, have a look where you're going to land. So this is also true that this says my industry has been in a slump for over a year. There are different jobs you find gradually. There's a lot of people being laid off in many jobs. So I believe that we should, as far as possible, acquire as many uh, professional skills as we can even if it needs, takes time to doing a particular course outside of my particular present boundary, that's good. If you can do it, do it, because it'll give you a wider scope to get a job when there are layoffs and things like that. This is an individual thing, and I believe that if you have any doubt about it, consult with older brothers in the church who have got more experience, will be able to guide you. So the next question is, the apostles had sleepless nights. They went hungry, thirsty, without shelter and without any exercise because Paul was sitting in a house for two years. How should we think about bodily health and prioritize it? Is there any point in our pursuit of the Lord or work of the Lord when we should hit the brakes if it damages our health or sleep? Or should we expect that everything done by faith of the Lord will outweigh any physical harm? What should our overall attitude towards our physical health be? I believe we should be sensible to recognize that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And just like a church building, you know, we clean the building, we maintain it. And uh, if you neglect it, even a building will collapse. And our body also, if you don't do anything, if you don't follow the laws of the body, you can get sick. Like I said earlier, if you eat unwisely, you can get sick. If you eat too much, you can get sick. I don't think any of us are in danger of eating too little. <laughs> Mostly the other way around. Uh, but we have to be wise in this area. and We need to sleep as well. Sleep is also necessary for our physical health. So, and if, and any type of exercise or playing games, I think is a very good thing. I find for myself, you know, as I get older, I felt I must do some walking every day. And sometimes it's the climate is too cold for me to go outside, so I got a treadmill. So I can do all the walking inside the house as much as I want every day and keep myself fit. The, the doctors say you must walk for at least 150 minutes in a week, which, I mean, they've calculated that or a lot of research is to keep yourself fit, which is about 25 minutes a day on six days of the week, to walk or some type of exercise that we need to, to keep ourselves physically fit. And it should be, otherwise, you know, we can lose our health and shorten our life. I personally have been very careful about I mean, that's partly because I have a doctor for a wife to in my eating and drinking that I don't, you know, eat the wrong type of food or things that will, or eat too much. I want to, I check my weight almost every day to see if it's going up to control myself. I think it's a, useful to have a weighing machine in the house. And... Uh, like saying, if you want to be spiritual, get a weighing machine. <laughs> because you, you got to be healthy, you know. Sometimes you don't realize your weight goes up and you don't realize it. And then, then you have to try and bring it down. So it's good to check these things. And if you're young enough to play games, I would encourage you to do that. That will also build fellowship with others in the church who are younger. I'm too old to do that now. But when I could... I did. And 
if you have any doubt about these things, you consult the older brothers in the church, or if you've got a health problem, consult your doctor before you do something which is excessive. What should our attitude be towards hobbies? Uh, I think for children, hobbies are very good, and it depends on how much free time you have. Hobbies are extra things beyond our work. Is relatedly, is it wise to intentionally look for opportunities to meet others in the community or be around unbelievers for the purpose of hoping to make an impact on them for the Lord, possibly through hobbies, volunteering, kids' activities, consistent patronage of a business, etc.? Now, I'm not so keen on consistent patronage of a business. <laughs> uh, some people want to do that, they can do that, but I think we, we're not so wealthy to throw around money and all that. But if there's, are there, you know, a lot of things like there are children's, a lot of homeschooling people. They get the opportunity to meet other homeschooling moms and children and to get involved in their activities. And can give you an opportunity to witness to them. And I know people in some of our churches who have come to the church through being through a witnessing that came through homeschooling opportunities with the parents. So that's a good to take advantage of. I believe we should look for every possible opportunity to be a witness for Christ. And and one way we can be a witness, not by preaching. The first thing we should try to do is to encourage people. The world is full of people who are discouraged. So you look around and say something cheerful to encourage people. Don't witness to them straight away. Get, become friendly by encouraging them. And then sometimes an opportunity may open up to put in a word and someone you meet regularly, you don't have to preach the whole gospel in one day, but little by little become friendly and with the aim, Lord, I want to, people I'm knowing for so long, I don't want them one day to tell me, you knew about Jesus and you never told me. I mean, if it's just somebody I meet occasionally, it's another thing, but if I'm regularly with somebody and I don't let it know, be known that I'm living for eternity, not for this world. How we present it is another issue. We should not be crude or rude, but I think it's important for people to know that I'm a Christian. I felt when I was working in the Navy that all the people who work around me should somehow know that I'm a different type of Christian than the others. And there were various ways in which I could do it. I could keep a New Testament or a Bible on my table, just keep it there. Or, you know, when all the others are drinking alcohol, drink a glass of orange juice or something. And I wouldn't usually thrust myself on others in witnessing. But if I'm a little different, they would come up and ask me, why are you like this? And they open the door then. And I tell them why I'm like this. I go... By, and the other very big thing we can do, I feel, I was greatly encouraged by, you know, Joseph in prison. He saw these two pharaohs, butler and baker. How did Joseph become next to the pharaoh? It's very interesting to see it. It is because he had the ministry of encouragement. He, even though he was in prison, he didn't feel sorry for himself and sit and moan over his own problems. He saw these two, the Pharaoh's butler and baker lying there, uh, wine bearer and baker there, discouraged. And he went up and said, hey, fellas, why are you discouraged? That opened the door, which ultimately led to his coming before Pharaoh, if you read that story. And that's something, you know, there, if you look around and you see somebody in your office, perhaps, whom you know well, and... He's feeling a bit down and if you know him well enough, you can ask him, don't ask him any details about what's the reason, but hey, can I encourage you? Can we, can we go out for a cup of coffee or something and 
sit and encourage him. His spirit is lifted little by little. He may open the door for him to, to, give, you, to give him the gospel. So, there are many ways if we are always alert, the Lord will open the doors for us. Okay, the last question is fellowship with brothers in the church. What does fellowship among brothers practically look like? I think basically it means being open to encourage whenever there's an opportunity and to inquire, is there something I, so if you see somebody weighed down, to find out, is there, is there a problem? Can we pray for you? An interest in the other person to encourage or to ask if you can help, that builds fellowship. And if you're always alert to that, not in an artificial way, I believe that the, uh, some people's temperament is like that. They automatically do it. But some people like me, that's not my temperament. <clears throat> my basic temperament is more reserved and shy and quiet. So I have to come out of my shell when I go to someone and share something. But some of you are already sort of extroverts. Then it's easy for you. But it's good for the rest of us to try and be open towards you know, if you share a word of encouragement, particularly with younger people, it's easier. You're an older person. You meet some young brother. I'm never tired of repeating the fact that when I was a very young person, about 30 years old, someone, I was in another country, and a much older person, I think he must have been six, double my age, and he didn't know much very good English either. All he could say to me is, brother, God has got a plan for your life. That was enough. It boosted me like anything. Because I was a young 30-year-old, discouraged about certain things. I didn't know what God's plan for my life was. It just encouraged me that out of the blue, this person said this. So sometimes a word like that can encourage someone. And it doesn't cost much. It doesn't can build fellowship too.